Welcome students to the introductory course of the Medical and Health Humanities Studies program. It's abbreviated MHHS and we'll get you acquainted with the whole alphabet soup shortly. This is an interdisciplinary program from departments across the college for the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, abbreviated CHAS. The program is housed currently in the English department, but we will draw from faculty expertise in many other departments, including but not limited to, and hold on, this is going to be a long list, history, art history, media and cultural studies, MCS, dance, theater, film, and digital production, TFDP, creative writing, gender and sexuality studies, GSST, Hispanic studies, philosophy, religious studies, anthropology, economics, ethnic studies, political science, psychology, and sociology. So I promised you alphabet soup, so there you have it. Um, already at this point, you might be asking, what do all these disparate disciplines across CHAS have to actually say about medicine and health? After all, shouldn't we, as we're all now really familiar with in the age of COVID, just trust the science? Shouldn't we just leave medicine to the medical folk? What could we, as humanists, contribute to the understanding of something so real and concrete as the fleshy mechanisms of our organs, our neurons, and blood? The age of COVID certainly has us walking a very fine line, and this class will invite you to explore the boundaries between valuing humanistic discourse about health and just irresponsibly fabricating conspiracy theories uh, about, for example, chemtrails and electromagnetic magnetic trackers and vaccines. There is value in the former and none in the latter. This course will help you become more attuned to the coercions and inequities of our medical institutions while still maintaining a critical and pragmatic view of the ethics of healthcare. The University of California, Riverside, UCR, as you might already know, is a Hispanic serving institution, HSI. So perhaps the most salient starting point to the why question of MHHS starts at the racial politics of health. Now, this is the, perhaps the most concrete example of why we need humanistic inquiry instead of an immovable, institutionalized way of doing things. So perhaps the one common thread of modern history that almost everyone learns about in at least high school is the history of eugenics. This is a history well worth studying in detail, but I won't just rehash it here for the sake of brevity and because you probably just know a lot of it already. Um, but even though we're all somewhat aware of this history, uh, we frequently hold a common misconception about it. We might think that scientists and medical professionals were just completely objective rationalists who were just perverted by Nazi racism and ideology. In fact, it was actually more the other way around. It was largely medical scientists who invented racial hygiene in the first place. So there's a common tendency to think of medical scientists as detached observers of objective truth who couldn't possibly advocate something so horrendous as genocide. History has shown us, however, that it was frequently um, exactly those enlightened scientists who were worried about eliminating any infelicities in the bloodline um, to promote what they thought of as maximal human flourishing. Um, so, all right. So another frequently cited example um, is the U.S. Public Health Service's collaboration with the Tuskegee Institution in Macon, Alabama. In 1932, these medical scientists uh, began a study on 600 black men who were told horrible lies about their, quote, bad blood. Using meager compensation, they coerced these men to become unwitting test subjects. The utilitarian calculus was that the public good of developing effective syphilis treatments outweighed the well-being of 600 black men. And these examples of racial hygiene and unethical racist medical experimentation are not just forgotten vignettes of a crueler bygone time. How great would that be? Um, even now, food insecurity, mental health, diabetes, respiratory disorders, toxicity, reproductive health, and even COVID-19 infections are all inflected by this same history of the racial politics of health. Nothing has changed, it seems. The mantra of, quote, trust the science that developed through our pandemic era was useful in warding us against 
the most outrageous and the most dangerous suggestions about UV light, ivermectin, and hydrochloroquine. But it is also a dangerous and I think disingenuous erasure um, of the violent history of our medical practices. As headlines of the past few decades have stressed, public health threats, including air pollution, proximity to hazardous waste sites, contaminated water supplies, impacts of climate change, limited access to reproductive services, denial of basic health care, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic, all of these things all are di disproportionately affecting communities of color. And yet, as the pandemic has made all too evident, the work of active institutional change in the face of such inequities has really not kept pace. At UCR, we are fortunate, I think, to have an established collective of scholars who are all actively working on narrative, discursive, and visual cultures of healthcare across disciplines, historical periods, geographical areas, methodologies, and cultures of study. The MHHS program will prepare you to address issues like the structural environment, environmental racism that impacts the mental and physical health of our students, our colleagues, and our surrounding communities. So even if you're not going into the medical field, um, for example, studying to be a physician, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physical therapist, etc., you can really take this training anywhere you go. We all have bodies, and the ways we interpret, stigmatize, valorize, medicalize, and diagnose our embodied variabilities will always be an important component in how we inhabit this world. If I have you on board with the answer to the why question, let's move on to the how. The structure of the course will largely be based on introducing you to UCR's collective expertise in the medical and health humanities. Each week, we will focus on an article-length work of one UCR scholar to develop our toolkit for talking about medicine and health from a humanistic perspective. Instead of using um, a health humanities textbook with just really abstract definitions that you have to memorize, I think it'll be much more productive if we just dive right into the most pressing issues and cutting edge work that's being done right here at this university. So um, you can worry about all those precise definitions of MHHS terms in later courses that you take in the program. Um, so here, in this introductory course, I'm mostly interested in just motivating some of these questions, concerns, and issues. Because so we're, we're extremely fortunate uh, here to have some of the world's best scholars and artists in their fields. So the best use of our short 10 weeks, I think, will be to tap into these amazing resources right at our fingertips. The course will also give you a preview of other courses you may take in the MHHS program. So if you find the work of a particular UCR professor, scholar, or artist especially fascinating, make sure to contact that person to see if they are teaching an MHHS course in the next few quarters or the next few years. Um, or if they're not, um, just reach out to set up some office hours to see if you can discuss your interests in the field. All right, so here is some institutional history on how we got here. In 2014, UCR successfully began all of these interdisciplinary conversations, implemented innovative curricula, and worked to establish this MHHS program with the NEH-funded grant, Narrative and Tandem, Creating New Medical and Health Humanities Programming. So this was all before I arrived at UCR in 2016. In 2023, with a program now officially approved, the program is now housed in the English department, which is my home department. So, along with Professor Carla Mazio, uh, I'm heading up the MHHS program. And if you have any further questions about the program beyond this introductory course, um, please reach out to either of us, um, either me, Fusan Wang, or Carla Mazio, also in the English department, with any questions or concerns. All right, so we're still talking about the how at this point. Um, and I'll address that question from my perspective, my, my kind of personal perspective as a disability studies scholar. Frequently, the how about the health and ability of the human body is, uh, it, it just remains a strictly clinical question. The medical anthropologist Michel Foucault was perhaps the most influential voice in the late 20th century to describe this arrival to our modern clinical moment. In his book, The Birth of the Clinic, published in 1963, Foucault explains 
why it's so hard to talk about this how. And this is a quote from him. The clinic, constantly praised for its empiricism, the modesty of its attention, and the care with which it silently lets things surface to the observing gaze without disturbing them with discourse, owes its real importance to the fact that it is a reorganization in depth, not only of medical discourse, but of the very possibility of a discourse about disease. So let's start with the parenthetical remark between the M dashes before moving outward to the main clause of the sentence. There are three qualities that he says are uh, of the clinic that we tend to praise. Number one, empiricism. Number two, modesty. And number three, care. So we praise the clinic because it is empirical. It uses externally verifiable and reproducible data. Because it is modest, it efficiently reads off the salient information from the sick body without any wasted attention. And because it is careful to avoid the subjective discourse of the patient. The clinician silently collects, quote, things, presumably meaning legible bodily symptoms, with an observing medical gaze that gets around the subjective problem of discourse, or in other words, of the patient just blabbering on about their own body. That clinical gaze sees not a person, but a collection of things surfacing from the body. So now we can move on to the main clause of the sentence. The power of this clinical gaze is that it is not just a, quote, reorganization in depth, or what he means by that, it's a shifting around of existing medical discourse, but a more fundamental shift in the, quote, very possibility of a discourse about disease. In this clinical model, the patient need not speak or discourse at all. The clinical gaze can fill in all the blanks itself. So we praise the empiricism, modesty, and care of the clinic so much that we have just given up talking about our bodies ourselves. And this is why the how of MHHS is so difficult. How can we possibly talk responsibly about our bodies uh, when the clinic has become so empirical, so modest, and so careful that it neither needs nor wants us to? Since the question, since the how question is so structurally difficult, we'll be talking about Emily Ratblack's essay, Proof of Loss, for an example. The title itself speaks to this difficulty. As she is narrating the early passing of her son, Ronan, she begins to reflect on the bureaucracy around life and death. Quote, according to his death certificate, a piece of light blue paper with a vaguely royal looking imprint from the funeral home that must be presented to prove, as the insurance company calls it, proof of loss, a document I would photocopy and file and stare at for months after his death. My son, when he died, just before the age of three, was never married, born on March 24th, 2010, in possession of a social security number, 611-81-4007, inactive in the armed forces, a member of no tribe. Those boxes remained unchecked. He was a baby, then a boy, and then, after the moment of his death, which is actually not recorded accurately on the certificate that proves he died, which is a way of proving that he lived, he was a decedent. Here, Rat Black defamiliarizes the authoritative meaning of the titular word proof. Proof is a deduction towards an incontrovertible, conclusive, and propositional truth. It is a series of logical steps to arrive from premises to a, an, an irrefutable conclusion. And yet, the death certificate proof, that proves Ronan died is far from authoritative. The narration begins by offering a challenge to the closed discourse of the bureaucratic clinic and rethinking what it means to craft a real proof of loss. Later, we hear about her thoughts of self-harm or perhaps that she, quote, didn't live at all, but existed half alive, half dead in some liminal space. In that paragraph, she concludes that there is no official proof of those final moments, no photos, no words. Proof, as she develops through the essay, is something far stranger and far more human than a piece of light blue paper. The word proof 
gets transmuted and distorted through her loss, her meetings, her dinner parties, the end of her marriage to Ronan's father, the beginning of her relationship with Kent, and the birth of her daughter. So I'm using this example to begin our discussions of the medical and health humanities because I think it really helps highlight the often contradictory, developing, and messy discourse that clusters around our notions of health and embodied flourishing. So instead of privileging the efficiency of the Foucauldian gaze that observes silently and empirically with little to no input from what he calls discourse, this essay by Rap Black forces us to slow down and consider what Tay-Sachs disease actually means, how it affects relationships, and maybe even what it means for the ethics of genetic screening. Ultimately, instead of reading off symptoms from a silent body with clinical empiricism, modesty, and care, Rat Black is acting here as the anti-clinician, constantly trying to make the sick, the dying, and the dead body talk. 